verse number two. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thou soul prospereth. What is he saying? It's a fact that you have been blessed spiritually. But now that blessing must flow into your health. Now how many of you know God does not want to compartmentalize our blessings? He blesses us in the spirit first. But doesn't stop there. The Bible says he's able to keep us blameless. Body, soul and spirit. At the coming of our Lord Jesus. Let me make this very clear. All areas of your life. There's no area of your life which is off limit. God wants his blessing to permeate. And I want some of you to receive this promise this year. Lord, I want everything that you started in my life to permeate. Come on, somebody. Into areas that are still, I believe, not being blessed by God. I want it to permeate. And I made a statement at the beginning of this year. I said, if there is any place that's porous in your life, this will permeate. So let's keep ourselves with a porous, a sense of humility, surrender to receive God's blessing. Now I thought to myself, I've been thinking about it. Is there one word in the Bible that captures this truth? One word. A lot of words came into my mind. If I was wondering if there's one word in the Bible that will capture this truth in its entirety. And I found that word. In fact, I think that's the only word. That is a bit quick. I wanted you to think. <laughs> shalom. The word is shalom. You know, I wanted people to get this into your heart. This word, I believe, of all the words in the Bible, some words come close I should say, but of all the words, this is a word that captures this truth more than any, any other word. I'll tell you what it means. If you go to Israel, they'll say, Shalom, Shalom Aleikum. Shalom Aleikum. Let peace be upon you. If you go to Arabic countries, they'll say, Salam Aleikum. And then the person will repeat or respond by saying, Aleikum, Malikum, Salam. So that's a word. Very commonly used. Now remember, when we say the word peace, we have this sense of mental tranquility. But how many of you know that's only one portion of it? The word peace, shalom, is one word that has been translated with at least 70 different words in the, in the Bible. 70. It's a multicolored you know, word. Shalom. It doesn't just mean peace of mind. It means to be safe. To be sound, healthy, perfect, complete, signifies a sense of well-being, harmony, both within and outside. Completeness, wholeness, peace, health, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity. Fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation. Now don't look at your neighbor now. Some of you are sitting beside an agitation it seems. Or discord, state of calm without anxiety or stress. Can I wish my church shalom? Amen. Can we read that few more? Words Now, let me say that once again. I want this to go into your heart. The root meaning of shalom, if you go and especially read the strong concordance, the strong Hebrew and Greek concordance, and they've got a lot of meaning. The root meaning of shalom is to be whole or sound, and this leads to translations that speak of completeness, wholeness, well-being, welfare, and peace. Shalom also includes the idea of vigor. All of our older people say amen. amen. Vitality in all dimensions of life. In short, shalom speaks of holistic, complete health for our souls and spirits. Now let me speak today. Do you believe Jesus can give you shalom? 
Oh, let me ask you once again. Do you believe Jesus can give you a shalom that will transcend every area of your life and permeate into every corner of your being? If you believe that, shout a hallelujah, shalom. Nothing left unattended by this word. The Hebrew word is shalom, which is more than the cessation of hostility. It's God's word for wholeness and goodness and total satisfaction in life. This is the abundant life Jesus promised in John 10.10. I give you life and life in abundance. In this context, can we celebrate The fact that we have a savior whose name is Prince of Peace. He is the giver of peace. If you believe that, can you put your hands together for the Prince of Peace? His name is Shalom. Shalom. I want to go deeper into this and I want to, I want, see, it's, it's all. I know when, when Shalom happens, it's, it covers all areas of your your life, including the cells of your body will come under the shalom. Can I read that once again for you to get this? If you want to read it on your own, you can go home and write it down, speak it. To be safe. Somebody say amen. Sound, healthy, perfect, complete, completeness. Harmony both within and with, without. On the outside. Peace, health, welfare, safety. Soundness, tranquility, prosperity, fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation or irritation, discord, a state of calm without anxiety or stress. If you believe this is the word Jesus used, peace be upon you. How many of you want to walk in the fullness of God's peace? Can you for a minute, for a second, put your hands together. Give a Lord an agreement as I go further from you. Amen. Now listen to this. But Jesus, when he said about Shalom, he gave a qualifying statement. He gave a certain condition in two places. Can we look at one of the conditions in Matthew chapter 10? Can you read from 12 onwards? When you come into a house... Salute it. Meaning, Jesus was saying, when you come to house, say, peace be upon you. And if the house is worthy, now, God says, if anybody is worthy of it, let your peace come upon it. But if it, if it not be worthy, let your peace return with you. So it means it's not just a merely a salutation. It is something which is so effective That means something happens when you speak the word peace. It is not just merely a good morning or good afternoon. When a child of God speaks the word peace, something happens in the atmosphere. This is what Jesus said. When you go to a house, just say, peace be upon it. If anybody is worthy, the house is worthy, they will receive it. If it's not, the peace will come back to you. Now, the moment I thought about it, how many of you know the Noah's Ark? And the dove was sent from the ark. And the dove is a representation of peace. How many of you know the dove went, didn't find a place to settle? It came back. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. You will speak the word peace, and if the house is ready, they'll receive it. If they're not ready, you will get the peace coming behind you. So how many of you want to start using the word peace? You're not going to lose. In any case, it's not a losing game. You're going to get peace more and more. Can somebody shout peace? Shalom. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus said. Now, in another place, Jesus said, if somebody in that house is worthy, not the house, but somebody in the house is worthy, the peace will settle in that house. Now, let me ask you this. Are we worthy of peace? I'm going to ask that question once again. Jesus said, if you're worthy, this peace will stick to you. Are you worthy of peace? I'm not talking about a sense of good feeling. I'm talking about all the blessings of God. Are you worthy of peace? Shalom. 
The Bible says there was a time that we were in hostility with God. That we were the choice vessels of wrath. But God in his mercy has broken down the barriers and made us to have peace with God and now we have become the objects not of wrath but of peace and mercy from God. Now let me ask you once again, do you believe Jesus Christ made you worthy to receive this shalom? Now I want to ask that once again. How many of you believe Jesus Christ made me worthy to receive this shalom? If you believe that shalom, shalom, alaikum, hallelujah. Now let me go ahead. The other story, the other place where Jesus said, This is historic. This is, I think, the poignant description of, of how somebody could miss it. I want to move there for a minute. You know, if you read the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, towards the end of his life, he knew what was in store. The Bible says he was going there to die. On his way, we see how he asked his disciples to get a donkey. Luke 19. This is very important. And, and, and as they were going and Jesus riding on this donkey, the Bible says the children and the, the, the faithful ones, they started to throw garments and, and shout, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A, a, a quotation from the book of Psalm. And, and Jesus rode. And how many of you know, that day the Pharisees came and said, Tell your disciples to keep quiet. Because they're making a lot of noise. I believe they were from Zion. Come on. If you feel guilty, that's okay. We'll deal with it later. Amen. They were shouting and screaming. And how many of you know there were... I wanted to observe that. You can go home and read. Every time Jesus heard people declare who he is, he... He asked them to refrain from it. In fact, he commanded them to keep quiet. He said, the time has not come. Shh. He didn't even let the demon say who he was. But that day was different. Jesus said, today, it's a free day. Free day of praise. If my disciples don't speak out my praise, if they keep quiet, these stones shall praise me instead. In the Greek it is written, if the disciples keep quiet, the stones are going to come out and say, Hosanna. Let me tell you, the reason we are making some noise in Edmonton, we don't want the stones to praise on our behalf. We want us to give God the best praise that we can. Somebody shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord. The stones will praise me instead, Jesus said. And another kind of uh, unusual statement. Jesus never wanted his disciples or even people to recognize him as a king. But that day they called him the king. We call the king. They said, blessed is a king. And Jesus did not stop them. Why was that so important? I want to listen carefully. But there is a beautiful word there. Which I still find it kind of enigmatic. Can we go there please? Luke chapter 19. A very powerful word. It's going to be a very powerful day this afternoon. Luke 19. And verse number 38. Luke 19, 38. Saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. When Jesus was born, it was said, Peace on the earth. But now there's no more peace on the earth. It's peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. You know God was taking his disciples. Even though they didn't understand all the gravity of what they were speaking. They were prophesying because that was an important moment from God's point of view. From God's perspective it was the most important moment for Israel. So they were making a statement. What was the statement that they were making? You know, God's heaven is filled with peace. And anybody that connects with heaven will receive it. 
not a blanket peace upon the earth. It's only for the children of God. God said, my God shall bless your heart. The God of peace. And the Bible speaks to, the, the, to believers. The peace that passeth all understanding. Jesus made his disciples the, the unique club. The elite club, if you could call them. Saying, I give you my peace. So God was taking the, the, the message of peace overall. And giving it to people who will connect with heaven. But I want to make a statement. One day, peace on earth will happen. Not because of you and no. But because the prince of peace is coming. And he will reign on this earth. I want everybody to say an amen. amen. He will reign on this earth. Now let me go ahead. And Jesus went further and the Pharisees were kind of ticked off with Jesus. They were cross with Jesus for what his disciples did. They were angry at Jesus. And Jesus made a statement. This is important. Verse number 41 and 42. And, the, and when he was come near Jerusalem, he beheld the city and wept over it. The word wept is not silent trickling down of tears, but loud voice he wept. Next verse. Saying, if thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day. I like the word. This is your day. This is your moment. If you had recognized this day, which belong unto thy peace. That means a decision has to be made on a certain day for peace to become part of your life. If you don't do that, but now they are hid from thy eyes. Look at the next verse. For the, for the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee on every side. If you miss this day of peace, you'll have to encounter days of trouble. I want everybody to listen carefully. This is the words of Jesus. If you miss this moment, which is your day of peace, if you miss one day, you'll have to face many days of trouble. Do you look at that word. One day, thy day, and many days. Days of trouble. And it happened. They say over a million Jewish people were killed. Just few years, probably 40 years after Jesus said this. Jesus said this generation will not pass away. A generation in the Bible is 40 years. It happened. Now listen closely people of God. Thy day. That means we can choose a day where peace will be our companion. Or miss that day and make trouble our companion forever. How many of you want to say today, I'm choosing the day, the moment of my life, and make peace for the rest of my life. I don't want to be sleeping with trouble. I'm not talking about your husband or wife. I, mean, I don't want to be journeying with trouble. I want to have peace. Now, why did Jesus say that? Listen carefully, people of God. Why did Jesus say this day, if you know what will make it peaceful for you? Alas, you missed it. He cried. Jesus does not want anybody to live in trouble. He wants them to live in shalom. He cries when that is not seen in the lives of his people. And I want to declare over here today, if anybody is held in that situation of perpetual discomfort from all sides like thorns in your flesh, God says it's a desire of Jesus that you will walk in shalom. You will move in shalom. How many of you want to say, I receive the shalom of God? If you believe that, shout hallelujah. That's God's plan for your life. Or somebody receive it. 
Jesus is not rejoicing over people not having shalom. He cries over them. Every time that there is a there is a friction within and without, there is a sense of you know brokenness inside. There's a sense of everything is segmented and fragmented. Even for you to survive, you have to compartmentalize your life. That's not the life that Jesus planned for you. It's a life of complete peace. Everything in your life is held secure in the hands of God. How many of you want to say, God, I don't want to miss that. If that's your prayer, can you make yourself known in the house of the Lord? I don't want to miss that peace of God. But why did he say that? What went wrong? To understand this, I want to make a statement. Please take, take this. I'm not going to qualify it because I believe it's an absolute statement. Listen carefully. I believe it was not the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that changed history for Israel. The death of Jesus Christ or, 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 or the Jewish people had no bearing on it. It was predetermined by God. And the timing of God, it happened. So Lord, let's not blame the Jews. It is God's eternal plan. But I believe the day that Israel lost it, the defining moment, according to Daniel and according to Zechariah, is the day that Jesus rode on the donkey. They rejected him. Israel's history is changed forever on that day momentous day, an eventful day. And let me make this very clear. That was the day God said, Nav, they have chosen pain over peace. Let me make this very clear. Every moment is precious. Let's not miss those moments. God is doing something beautiful. But when the moment comes, some of you who are quiet should start praising. Because that was the day Jesus said, Let my children sing even more louder because something is happening in the heavenlies. Let me tell you, when the moment comes, don't sit quiet. Your life has been liberated by praise. Can somebody shout an amen in the house of the Lord? Now listen, now listen. To understand this, to understand this, we need to go to a story. Now here comes the suspense. To understand why they missed that peace, we need to go to a story from the Old Testament. A story that is so fascinating, it captivated my mind so much. You know, it is both endearing and intriguing. And it's also encouraging. Such powerful truth. I'm talking about a man in the Bible whose name itself means something that is not good. The Bible talks about a man, Nabal. Do you know Nabal? If you don't know Nabal, you would definitely know Mrs. Nabal. Abigail. Uh Uh-huh. It's coming. And this lady, and Nabal's story is interesting. Now listen carefully. Nabal, David was in, in wandering and is about to become the king of the 400 nomads wandering with him. He's now not stuck to a place. He's hiding from Saul and things are not good. He's in the wilderness of Judea. And then he sends some of his people to get some food from this rich man. Can we read that? 1 Samuel chapter 25. Can you read from verse number 2 onwards? Listen carefully. I think this will give us a clear idea of how somebody can miss their peace. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Look at the next word. And the name of the man was... You know what's the meaning of the word Nabal? Fool. Can you imagine somebody calling Nabal? Hello darling Nabal. Fool! That's the meaning of the word. Nabal! And the name of his wife was Abigail, the joy of the father. And she was a woman of good understanding. This is the first time the wife is presented as a contrast to her husband. 
And the woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. That means she had both a beauty and brain. But the man was churlish and evil in his doing. And he was house of Caleb. From a very good family. But the Bible says a man was churlish. That means unreasonable man. You know, you couldn't. It was impossible to reason with him. It was impossible to deal with him. It was impossible to talk with him. It was impossible to live with him. He was offensive, stubborn and stingy. <laughs> now I don't want women to say amen here. <laughs> and and, and he, was a, he was a man who was such a... Somebody called him the ultimate fool. Neighbor. I'm sure he didn't get the name from birth because no mother would want his daughter to, son to be called Nabal. I think he acquired it. The town men gave him that name. Because he won't listen to anybody. He was an arrogant, he was a man who was such an offensive man, you can't stand him. And the wife was a woman of good understanding. And a beautiful countenance. And all the ladies said, Amen. No. Let's go ahead. And, and, and verse number 5 and 6. And David sent out 10 young men. And David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him that liveth in prosperity. He is in prosperity. Peace be both to thee. Peace be to thy house. And peace be unto all thou hast. This is called permeating prosperity. Peace to you. Peace to your family. Peace to everything that you have. I think he's the only man in the Bible who gets the triplicate mention of the word shalom. Peace, peace, peace. Can you imagine an angel comes to me and says... Peace be upon you. Peace be upon your family. And peace upon everything for me. I would say, glory, what should I do now? But this neighbor, fool, lost it. Lost it. God is about to give him permeating prosperity. It will spread. But he can't take it. Because his head is bigger than his body. Verse number 7. And now I have heard that thou wast shearers. Now the shepherds which were with us, we heard them not. Neither was there what ought missing unto them. All the while they were in Carmel. Now if he has been protected by David men. And verse number 10. Look at this man. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? <laughs> I feel like, you know, doing an acting here. Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants now a days that breaks away from their master. You know what he's saying? David is a loose cannon. Buzz off, kid. Who are you, Mr. Nobody? These are little guys who, 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 who just mushroomed in Esther's reign. Test. They just came up yesterday. They are rebels. And I'm a man with said, who is this guy? You know what? He's talking about the future king. Bad mistake, sir. Verse number 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I've killed for my shearers and give it to men whom I know not? That was the biggest mistake. I, know, I don't know this guy. That's a lie because everybody in the land knows David. Because they sang his song. Saul killed a thousand. David killed a ten thousand. But this man does not want to acknowledge David. Get out. Get out. Can you imagine David is sending shalom, shalom, shalom. He says, buzz off. If anybody is doing that today, you need special prayer. That's exactly what happened to the people of Israel at the time of Jesus. The prince of peace is walking among them. And they said, we don't want you. And Peter said, they crucified the prince of peace. 
Now Abigail comes and David says, David's men came back. <laughs> Verse number 13, I like this. David is a man who, will, who is ready to kill few people. David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword, and they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded and said, Now it's over. We'll go and, 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 and finish him off. We're going to kill all of them. All of them. Done. That's David. And thankfully, he was not a member of our church. <laughs> Enough. Finish them right there. The guy doesn't sleep in the church. Boom. But this is what had happened. Abigail steps into picture. Abigail goes and talks to David and prevents this death from happening. What was different about Abigail? What is, why is Abigail different? Of course, number one, she's not Nabal. That's a simple answer. But beyond that, she was wise, the Bible says. But she was not just wise, she was resourceful. She was so organized. Can you imagine, just at the, uh, just at the drop of a hat, in just a few minutes, she could prepare a banquet for 400 people. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody comes to your house without an appointment? Some of us have problem preparing for two people. She made 200 loaves of bread. She merely cooked. She was so rich. That means she's a woman of well organized. She didn't go searching for the pepper tin. And said, where do I keep my salt? You cannot prepare for so many people if you're not organized. He was, she was so smart. And the Bible says in Proverbs, the, the way of wisdom is peace. Anytime wisdom comes into play, there will be peace. But what made her, she, she, was, she prevented David from killing this man and his family. But what made her special? This is a key and with this we'll come to an end. Please read verse number 28. I pray thee, forgive thy trespass of thy handmaid. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. You know what she was doing? She was latching on to the prophecies. The promises that God has spoken. For Nabal, David is Mr. Nobody. He doesn't even look like a king. He's a wanderer. A rebel in the wilderness. But for this lady, she sees through the eyes of God. She saw David from what God spoke about him. She saw David from God's perspective. She saw David as a man carrying a promise. That means she values God's promise over the present circumstance. This is wisdom. Hallelujah. How many of you can say this afternoon? Yes, pastor. I know I'm going through some tough time. But because of a promise spoken over my life, I know God will take care of my future. Can I get a shout of amen in the house of the Lord? Somebody who sees a future from God's point of view, from God's prophecy, from God's promise point of view. Can I find somebody in this room who knows my future is settled? It's a sure future because because God has spoken over my life. If you believe that, can you shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord? She knew what David will become. A man, a woman who walks within the context of what they see in the today. What they see from today's point of view can become arrogant, can become absolutely reckless when it comes to the things of God. But let me tell you, anytime you put that aside and say, you know what? You don't look like a king now. You don't seem like a king now. But God has prophesied over you. God has promised over you that your kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. This lady believes in the word of God. How many of you know that's powerful? Nabal saw things from today's point of view. Abigail saw things from God's point of view. Nabal is called a fool. Abigail is called a wise woman. Abigail saw the future in connection to God's kingdom. 
Abigail saw the future in connection to God's purposes. And God is speaking to somebody. How many of you can say today, it might not look good today. It doesn't look seemingly today. But I believe God's word. No, you didn't hear that. I believe God's promise. I believe God's prophecy. I believe about the future. Can somebody lift up your voice and shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord? I believe. I believe. I believe things will change. I believe my family will change. I believe my future will be a blessing. I believe there's a revival in the land. I believe God's word will come true. Come on, somebody, start to behave like Abigail. Peace, shalom, shalom, shalom. Thank you. God is speaking to somebody. The moment you get so caught up within what you see as real, and you don't have the insight, neither the foresight, To see beyond that into the purposes of God. And establish by your words the power of God's promise. You are in terrible danger. Your action will say that. Your reaction will be bad. Your attitude will be wrong. Everything that you will do will land you in trouble. And God will call you a fool. But God says, is anybody in this room who will say things don't look good enough? But I know God is a God who will keep his promise. Come on. God is a God of purpose. God is a God of destiny. God is a God who will establish his kingdom. Somebody start to behave like Abigail. And because of that one lady... The entire household of Nabal was preserved. One lady. God preserved the entire household. And that's the reason the Bible says, where there is wisdom, there is peace. Can I find some woman here? Can I say, I want to tell something today. It's important. You know, when you look at the story of 1 Samuel, except for the first time the, the, uh, the prophet comes and anoints David and the miracle miraculous life story of David with Goliath and killing of the bear and lion. Beyond that, how many of you know I heard a word today? It's so powerful. Providence working in a secular manner. How can providence work in a secular manner? Meaning, there's nothing you know, overt. Nothing extraordinary. There's no flash of thunder and lightning in the sky. But God was working His providence within, within the dynamics of human activities. Meaning, Even somebody coming and talking to you is connected. It might look as if it's nothing. It might look so human. It might look something as insignificant. But when you are about to enter into a new season, hallelujah, everything is designed by God. Everything is planned by God. Can I get some response in the house of the Lord? Everything is God ordained. Everything is God planned. He is pulling the strings from behind. This is not something that you orchestrated. It is God who has orchestrated it for your life. Can I get a shout of amen in the house of the Lord? This afternoon the Lord is speaking to somebody. Some of the things that you look as normal. Some of the things that you see as nothing extraordinary. God says he's putting it together. Come on, if you believe that, can you receive it with a shout of amen in the house of the Lord? He is putting it together on your behalf. And look at this. She understood it. She understood it. She knew, she knew that David needs a word. Can you imagine? David needs a word. So she looked at David and said, I know that your kingdom will be a sure kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom that God has promised. You know, David got excited. He forgot this killing plan. Now he started to worship. If a woman and a man in this house can make the preacher shout for praise. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. If you can make an innocent shout for joy. Hallelujah. David had forgotten to dance for some time. But this wise lady, 
You know what? Sometimes when I talk to some people, I forget to dance. I really forgot. But this lady, she excited. She brought the promise and plan into David's life. And David says, now I know I have a reason. Don't worry about Nabal anymore. I have a reason. I have a purpose in life. The Lord told me God is going to raise up some people in this place that will make the preachers. That will make the ministers of the gospel have a new lease on their life. Will give them a new freshness. Somebody shout a hallelujah. That's your call. That's the anointing. Oh, Rabbi Shandalo. Oh, can I get some Abigails in this house? Can I get some men in this house who will say, Pastor, go forth, for the Lord is with you. Somebody shout a hallelujah. Let's build somebody. Let's encourage somebody. Let's push somebody. Let's bring someone into their destiny. Oh, hallelujah. I sense in my spirit. I cannot be wrong this time because it's from the Holy Spirit. I sense in my spirit we are on the verge of one of the greatest move of God. Even for our church, there's going to be a harvest. But before I enter into that, I'm going to encounter some Abigails in this house. Come on, somebody receive it. I'm going to encounter some Abigails in this house who will say, God, he's about to do it. God, he's about to do it. Somebody with the anointing of Abigail. Hey. You have only two kinds of people. Either you belong to the tribe of Nabal or you belong to the tribe of Abigail. If you belong to the tribe of Nabal, it's so simple. Who are you? From India? Five foot five? But let me tell you, can somebody look at the preachers and say, it doesn't look so big. It doesn't seem that big. But there is a promise of God. There is a word from heaven. Come on, somebody with the anointing of Abigail in the house of the Lord. Oh, this is a day. This is a day for Shalom. Shalom. Shalom is coming upon his people. Shalom. The kingdom of God will be built. The revival will happen. Edmonton belongs to Jesus. Canada will see the move of God. Shalom. Hey. Hey. I feel like preaching right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But listen to this. This is important. And David knew this. David can recognize wise woman. Now don't look at me like that. David knew this. You know what he said? He said to Abigail, Abigail. Verse number 32. 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, which sent thee. This day to meet me. There'll come a time, receive it as a prophetic word, when two people of God, two saints of God will come together. They will recognize the hand of God. The hand of God behind it. Some of you are going to be pushed into a supernatural lifestyle. If you believe that, shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord. Even your phone call will be led by the Holy Spirit. Even the conversations that you make will be anointed by the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But this is what I found interesting. Now this is, I don't want to say it's a revelation, but I have been seeing some things in dreams. In other ways. And I've been telling you for some time. When I see the number 10. God told me. Even through a dream. It's a sign of a new season. Do you see that here? Can you look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. And verse number first. The verse number 5. 25, 5. And David sent out 10. You look. Keep that in your mind. 10. And verse number 38 now. And it came to pass about 10 days after the Lord's mot 10 10. Look at Jesus now. Do you want to see, get some interesting? This is the time for some exciting you know, discoveries. Jesus, the day 
that that's the reason I believe these two are connected in the spirit. The day that Jesus said, the time has come. This is the day of a turnaround. Look what Jesus did. Can you come to Luke 19 verse number 11. 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable. Now look, look at those words. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem. That is a moment. The moment has come. And because they thought the kingdom of God should suddenly appear. Meaning a sense has happened. Something is going to happen. Some of you are walking in that sense. One, a sense. And two, a reality where things are going to change. Because he's about to enter Jerusalem. He said that. The defining moment has come. This is a turning point. He decided to say a parable. And, it, and the Bible says that's the reason he said the parable. But look at that parable. Verse number 12. He said, therefore a certain noble man went into a far country to receive himself a kingdom and to return. Next to us. And he called his ten servants and delivered them. For Samuel, 10, 10. Defining moment, 10. And that's the reason Jesus used that number. And Jesus, when he talked about the kingdom of God, he said 10 virgins. It's 10. 10 days to wait for the Holy Spirit. A new season is about to start. And I sense the name of that season is Shalom. If you believe that for your life, can you put your hands together? Give the Lord a shout of praise. Shalom! In every area of your life, shalom! But listen to this, people of God. What happened? Why didn't they get their peace on that day? That day, they rejected. Why did they reject? Same thing what Nabal did. They saw with their eyes, natural eyes. Who are you? King? Who's king? You're just a carpenter. You're the son of Joseph. But there were few people who said he is a king that has been prophesied. How many of you want to say today, in spite of what I see today, my God, he reigns. My future is not based on what I see today. It's in the promise of God. Can I get a witness somewhere here, please? A real witness somewhere here. Do you believe that your future is based on the promise of God? If you believe that, shout an amen in the house of the Lord. I'm going to pray over you right now. Pray over you. But the Lord told me this. From Psalm 29, 11. Psalm 29, 11. I'm going to lift up my hand and bless my people. Psalm 29, 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with shalom. The first time the word Jehovah Shalom appears. It's given to a man who was dreadful, is frightened, and is fearful that he is going to die. Gideon. He saw the angel of God is about to die, he thought. And God said, Jehovah, shalom. Meaning, you're not going to die. I hear in my spirit, the moment the word Jehovah shalom comes, death sentence of your life is suspended. Can somebody receive it? Death sentence spoken over your family, over your children, over your future, over everything in your life is cancelled in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout an amen and receive it in the name of Jesus. Death sentence is cancelled by the mention of Jehovah Shalom. But here is the word. I heard the Lord say it strong. I'll speak about it in the days to come. The Bible says he took our sins. He suffered for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace fell upon him. Meaning, the punishment for our peace, Jesus suffered. 
Why let such a suffering go waste? Jesus suffered to give you peace, shalom. Do you believe that? Come on, how many of you believe? He took the price to give me peace. Shalom is my right. I receive it in the name of Jesus. If that's your desire, meaning in every area of your life, not one area, every area of your life, there's going to be a shalom of God. If you believe that, can you stand up on your feet and receive this blessing in the name of the Lord? Everybody who believes, the price for your shalom, the payment for your shalom, Jesus took it on his body. I said to God, if that's what Jesus did for me, I will let no devil take that away from me. My Jesus didn't suffer in vain. Everything that he suffered, I am going to receive the blessing. Because I am redeemed by the cross, by the blood of Jesus. If you believe that, can you receive it in the name of Jesus in the house? I'm talking about shalom, shalom in the house. If you are really desiring that shalom, that, that composite, that comprehensive, holistic peace of God, I want you to just lift your hand. If you want, you can lift both your hands to heaven. And, and Jesus says, I am broken if you don't walk in it. But this is a day. It's either trouble from all sides or peace of God. Can you receive it now? And how many of you really want to connect that to your foundation? Meaning, this is not just because Pastor Anderson preached on it. Jesus paid the price for it. Come on, lift your voice and receive this blessing of God. I'm going to speak over you as you've lifted up your hand. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I want to say it from the Hebrew. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee shalom. And the people all said, Amen. Come on, amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, under the anointing, especially with signs that you were giving me, I know that your people are entering a new season. That day, this day, that moment is now arriving at our footsteps. And we are not going to let that pass by. We are entering a season where the peace of God shall surround us. God will bless his people with peace. There shall be permeating prosperity in the name of Jesus. And people who have been under the sentence of death are now being set free in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. And let the peace that passeth our understanding... Fill your hearts and minds from this day onward. I speak over my people. Shalom. Shalom upon you. Shalom upon your family. Shalom upon everything that you have. And those of you are willing to say yes to that. Come on, lift up your voice and say amen. Yay! Amen!